Now that you have seen how each of these basic sort, selection sort, insertion sort, and the bubble sort, they work, let's see algorithmically how do we frame a logic in terms of programming for performing these sorts. We'll also see the pseudocode for performing these sorts in this lecture, but we expect that uh, you are able to write from pseudocode to the C++ code on your, on your own. So if you have any questions, it's better to make a note of that and ask them in the office hours that we have next. So what we are going to do in this lecture is learn more about our three basic sorts, starting from selection sort, bubble sort, and insertion sort. So to revise uh, what we did while we showed the demonstration, while we saw the demonstration with using cards, in selection sort, what we were doing was we selected, we parsed through all the cards and we selected the minimum um, entity and then swap that minimum entity with the first entity. And after that, we continued doing so. So we were bringing the minimums to the front and we repeatedly did that until the whole array was sorted. So the concept in the selection sort is select the min element and swap that with first. In the first iteration, we swapped it with first. In the second iteration, we swapped it with second. And then we kept doing it until n minus one iterations. Until, because there are n items, we did parse to n minus one iterations. In the bubble sort, Again, as the name says, the concept is something is bubbling up. What is bubbling up? We did our parse through the elements. We compared the two consecutive elements in our array. And from that two consecutive elements, we bubbled up the larger one. So in bubble sort, we bubbled up. the larger element to the end by comparing two consecutive elements of array iteratively. Because we had to just by doing one parse, we'll just get our the largest element bubbled up to the last position. In the second parse, you will get the second largest element bubbled up to the second last position and so on and so forth. So we had to do multiple parse and in every parse we compared first two elements, then second and third element, then third and fourth element, so on and so forth. And we move the larger element to our right hand side. And that's how we ensured that when we are done with one iteration, the largest element bubbled up to the last position. Then finally in the insertion sort, again, it's very easy to remember as the name says insertion sort. So there is some insertion that we were doing. In insertion sort, we maintained two different arrays or we maintained a boundary be, um, between the elements of our array. And we said that the left hand side of this boundary is sorted and the right hand side of this boundary is unsorted. So we took, we maintained, or let's say we insert the elements from the unsorted, uh, unsorted 
part of array to the sorted part. of error with respect to its position. So whenever we are doing this insert, we need to ensure that the left part of the array, which we are maintaining sorted, is actually sorted. So every time you take an element from the right part, then you cannot just insert it anywhere onto the left part, but you need to find out that wherever there's an appropriate position for that element, you go ahead and insert there. For doing this, what we did was we created the space where we shifted the elements that are larger than the element that we want to insert to one, one space towards the right. Then finally, when we encountered an element that's smaller than the element that we want to insert, that's the perfect position for the element that we want to insert. So then we inserted that element there. So again, very easy to remember in selection sort, there is something to select. We go ahead, we parse through the array, we select the minimum, bring it to the swap it with the first element and so on and so forth. In bubble sort, there is something to bubble up. So we compare two elements, two consecutive elements in our array and in every iteration, we bubble up the largest element to the last one of the last positions and so on and so forth. We keep bubbling the larger elements towards the end of the array and finally our array is sorted. In insertion sort, there is something to insert. So we maintain a sorted part of the array and unsorted part of the array. Initially, your sorted part of the array is empty. Then you enter the first element of your array into the sorted part of your array. So imagine it as a virtual boundary between the elements of your array. And after that, you pick the second element, enter at appropriate position, wherever it is with respect to that element that's there on the left-hand side, because your left-hand side of that boundary is sorted. And we so on and so forth, we keep inserting things from the right to the left until our whole array is sorted. So these are your three basic sorts. Now that the concept of these sorts is very clear and you understand the concept behind and the logic behind this sort, let's go ahead and frame algorithm as well as the pseudocode for this sort. I repeat again that from the pseudocode, what we'll be discussing in this lecture is the pseudocode. I'll be writing pseudocode and we'll have it all over here. But from that pseudocode, you are expected to write your C++ code on your own. So take that pseudocode and convert that to C++ code with appropriate syntax. And that's what you'll be compiling and running. So let's begin with our selection sort first. what you are doing in selection sort. Let's just write down the algorithm that we want to do. So from algorithm, then it's easier for you to write the pseudocode. Let's write the steps of the algorithm. What we are doing is we scan an array to find its smallest element and swap it with the first element. This is what you'll do in your first iteration. In your second iteration, what you will do is starting with the second element, scan the element, to the right, because your first element is already the smallest element. That's where you start with the second element, and but everything to the right of your second element is still unsorted. So you scan the element to the right to find the smallest and swap 
it, now you will be not swapping it with the first because your first is already smallest. Now, whatever the next second smallest you find is larger than your first element, but smaller than everything else. So that's why you will swap it with the second element. And you will continue doing this until you are done with n minus one steps. Because there are n elements and the last element, single element by itself is always sorted by itself, right? So you need to do for n elements, you need to do n minus one um, pars or the iteration. So n minus one times you have to go out there, search the minimum and replace it with the, swap it with the appropriate position, depending on whichever iteration you are in. So in the n minus one iteration, you will compare last two elements and whichever is smaller, you will swap it, that's it. Then the, you are left with the last element, which is automatically the largest because you compare two elements. And if you say that in these two elements, the left one is smaller and the right one is larger, that's it, you are done processing your whole array. That's why we have n minus one iterations. It's very important to understand. So this process, this is your algorithm. Generally speaking, you can say that on pass i, where i is anything between zero to n minus two. Now notice that I'm starting my i counter from zero. So for n elements, you need to do n minus one steps. If you are starting your counter from zero in order to n minus one step, your counter should run until n minus two because you're starting it from zero rather than one. On pass i, find the smallest element in, for pass i, you will be searching the elements from a, if a is your array, you'll be searching the elements ranging from i to n minus one. n minus one is your last element of your array if your index is starting from zero. And swap it with, in pass i, you'll be swapping that element with a of i. So doing the steps will result into your A of zero, so on, until A of I minus one. This, all the elements in this left part of the array will be sorted in your iteration I. And from A of I to A of N minus one, this is your unsorted part of the array. So now this algorithm or the logic behind the behind performing selection sort is clear to you. Can you, are you ready to write pseudocode? Can you convert this logical steps of what we are doing into in form of for loop and arguments and variables and implementation of swapping, of how do you implement swapping by using multiple variables, all that, that's the pseudocode, right? I would say in order to move from algorithm, how to design a pseudocode of your own from algorithm, it's always easy to work with an example first. And it doesn't work if I just I work with example, also you need to work with example, or indeed you are the one who needs to work with the example. So when you work yourself, that's when you understand the concept better. So let's take this example with elements 89, 45, 68, 90, 29, 34, 17. Enough of elements. And take this example, work your way manually through uh, different iterations, right? There, here we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
five, six. We have seven elements in this array and work your way through. So process the steps, how things will happen in every iteration because you have seven elements in this array, you are going to have six iterations in order to sort this. So what will happen in your first iteration is let's say that your i is zero, right? Let's start with i from zero to six. Your i is zero initially. When you say you are starting from i zero to six, immediately what you should think about is a for loop that it rates from i equals to zero to i equals to six, correct? And six here is nothing but n minus one. So this for loop generic generically is iterating from i equals to zero to i equals to n minus one. What you're doing here is you are comparing the, okay, just reiterating on that statement, this for loop, does it need to iterate from zero to n minus one all the elements? No, because if we start from zero, let's just go back and look at this. If we start from zero, we can end our for loop of comparison at n minus two index, because when you are comparing last two elements, we swap in their respective incremental order and that's it, we are done. We don't have to process the last element. So our for loop of i will go from zero to n minus two. So what you do in your first iteration, you will take 89, you can set in order to go and find the minimum in the array, first you need to initialize your, you need to have a variable min in which you are going and putting the minimum element that you find. And in order to compare and get the minimum first, because we don't know anything about the array, you just know A of i and i is zero. So you just know A of zero. So let's just say initially our min is 89 because that's it is your world and you, because your whole world is just one element and that element is minimum. That's what we are assuming initially. So we initialize a variable, we say that's equal to 89. And then what we do is we go ahead and compare other elements with this min that we have assumed. If we find an element that's smaller than what our assumption is, then we say that, oh, we have found the new min. So now 89 is no more the min, but whichever uh, value we have found less of than 89, that's the min. And then we go ahead and going on comparing different elements of the array until we reach, reach the last element of the array. And once we have done that, once we have, are done with all these comparisons, then we can assure that whatever you have in that min variable is an actual minimum value from all the elements of that array, right? So that's how we go ahead and we pick our min. So initially we say that, okay, um, let me just erase this. So you have a concept of your first iteration. That's a for loop from i equals to zero to i equals to n minus two. And we have a variable called min. And initially we say min is equal to i because we don't know anything else. But then what we do is we have another variable, right? Because you have to go, uh, go forward in the array and compare everything. So you can say that you have this another variable j that it reads from your second element until your last element and it compares the value of j with the value of min. If you say that, if you find that a of j is lesser than min, then you go ahead and say that, okay, then I found a new min. So then min is equal to j. Because in min, we are not storing the value, we are just storing the index. If you know the index, you can always find the value by doing a of uh, min. So if we if this condition is true, then we do this. And that's how we go ahead and find our min variable, min element in the array. So after the first iteration, you would be comparing all, you will be iterating your j from j is equal to i plus one, correct? Because your i was your first element and you started comparing from your second element. So j equals to i plus one to until your j reaches the end, right? Because you have to compare with all the elements and you find the min from all the elements. You can't exclude the last element. 
So your J iterates from I plus one to N minus one. And what you do is the comparison of how we, what we just discussed and you find out the min, the actual min from this iterations. Once you have found out the actual min, so in your first iteration, your actual min will be 17 over here. Then you implement the swap, right? Then you have to swap that with your first element according to our algorithm. Um, now swap, how do you implement a swap, right? So that's your, again, something that should trigger thoughts while designing your pseudocode. How do you perform swap? Can you think of any way where there are like two variables storing two different information and you want to swap those? So you have A of min and you have A of i. Whatever you are storing in A of i, you want to put in this and whatever you are storing in A of min, you want to put in this location. How would you do that? In order to implement swap, you can have a temporary variable where you can say if the array consists of int, you can say int stem. And then in this temporary variable, you can store one of the value. Let's say first I store a of i into the temp variable. Then I shift whatever I'm storing in a of min into a of i. So then I say, okay, now let me say that A of i is equal to A of min. So we have shifted whatever we had in A of min into the location A of i. And finally, now we have the actual value of A of i stored in temp, right? So we don't have to worry about overwriting any information. So finally, what we do is A of min is equal to temp. Observe these three steps. What they do is we have two variables whose position we want to swap. We make an additional space. We initialize the temp variable. First, we move the whatever the item in the first variable is over here temporary. Then once we have made a copy of that first item, we overwrite the item in the first place with whatever we had in the second place, right? We overwrite it with the item over here. Then at this, after this, both, both these locations will have the same item. But finally, because you already have the copy of your first item in your temp over here, so you recopy that into the second location. So then your this item finally becomes temp. And that's how you have successfully swapped two items using an additional variable. Can anybody come up with a more smart way of swapping things around? What if we don't want to use this additional variable temp? Can you still swap without using an additional variable? You can, yes. And if you are not able to think of a way of how to swap using an additional variable, I would say that's your intellectual quest. Think of it for yourself. Google, search for it, and you should be able to find a way to swap without using an additional variable space. So that's your challenge. Figure that out on your own. Okay, so then that's this is the step what you do in your first iteration. And as a result of your first iteration, what you would have is now your array will look like 17, 45, 68, 90, 29, 34, and 89, because we have successfully swapped 17 and 89. Now in your second iteration, your i will be incremented with one. That's your outer for loop, which you are running for i from i equals to 
zero to n minus two, and you are running an inner for loop for j, which is going from i from j equals to i plus one to n minus one, right? So your i will be incremented after your first iteration, as well as your j will now be the new i plus one. So new i is your one. So your j will also be incremented. So in your second iteration, you will initialize your min to 45 and then you will find out is there any other item towards the right of this element 45, which is lesser than 45. If you find that you will swap it with 45 and so on and so forth. So I want you to complete this seven iterations for seven items, we'll have six iterations, right? And minus one steps. So I want you to complete all these iterations uh, on your own because that will allow you to flush out your thought process in a much better way. And doing that is important because that allows you to remember whatever you are learning for a long period of time. And it's not just stored in your temporary memory, but it's stored in your permanent memory. Once you are done with that, then, well, then what else? finally write your pseudocode, right? If you are done with that, if you understand the algorithm, if you understand the steps, then now you should be able to write your pseudocode. So let's help me out in writing this pseudocode. Are you ready? Selection sort. As soon as we start writing pseudocode, we need to think of variables, arguments, loops, all those, right? So what will be the input argument for the selection sort? What is What are the things that you need as an input to efficiently perform this operations of selection sort? You definitely need an array because otherwise what you will sort. So you need an array and it would help if you if you have the size of the array, right? Because all our rule loops are going from um, zero to n minus one, n minus two like that. So where n is the size. But in case if you don't have size of the array, you can always compute the size of the array inside the selection sort. But here for simplicity, let's assume you have size of the array. So then what you will do inside the selection sort is as we just discussed, and as we learned while doing, while processing this example in the way how computer would process, we learned that we'll have two for loops where first for loop that iterates on i from i equals to zero to n minus two and we'll have another for loop inside this for loop somewhere. And this for loop will iterate from j equals to i plus one to n minus one. Now inside first for loop, initially what we are doing, we are saying that, okay, we are initializing min while you are writing a C++ code from the pseudocode you need to declare the variables at appropriate locations and you need to perfectly implement the syntax. You cannot just say i equals to zero to n minus, um, n minus two, but rather you need to follow the syntax of C++, which is not tough for smart students like you because it's something that's there and you just need to implement that. So implementing syntax is the easiest part the most difficult part is to frame your own pseudocode. First is when you are given a problem to frame your own algorithm to solve the problem, that's the difficult part. Then once you crack out your algorithm, once you come up with a solution that Yahoo, you have a solution that could give you an answer or that could solve the problem that was given to you. Like problem here is sorting and we are looking at algorithms that solve the problem of sorting. Then you frame, once you have algorithm, you take that and you think in the language of computer. Okay, what would computer need? How many variables would it need? How many, what should I initialize? What should I, how many loops will I have? Which loop will be inside which loop? Or my loop should go from what index to which index, right? So you take an example 
and you walk your thought process through all this operations in which computer would process your algorithm that you have framed, then that's your pseudocode. Once you have your pseudocode, then this is like almost like everything that you need. Then this pseudocode you can flush into any language, C++, Python, Java, with just knowing the syntax of that language. And syntax of the language is just one Google search away. So that's not something that's moving from pseudocode to C++, C++ code is not something that's challenging, but making your pseudocode is the most challenging part. Making your algorithm is the most challenging part whenever you are given a new problem. And these are the things you should not just remember that um, these are the things that they, they are not to memorize, but they are to understand. And once you understand them, you can solve any new problem that's given to you on your own. So what we say is initially for i equals to zero uh, to n minus two for every i, we initially say that, okay, because I don't know anything, my min is equal to i. And after that we have, let me write a bit down. So your min is equal to i. And after that you have this for loop that goes, um, I'm just trying to write an alignment. And then you have this for loop that iterates from j equals to i minus one to n minus uh, i plus one, the one element after i, until the last element n minus one. What we do inside this for loop is if a of j is lesser than min, or because min is our index, so we'll have is if a of j is less than a of min. Always remember that whenever you are writing any program, then working with index is much preferred way because if you know the index, you can find the element whenever you want. But if you know the element, you cannot find the index, right? So keeping a track of something from which you can know more that's more preferable than just storing the value directly. So every time you work, if you have an option of working with index, that's what you should opt for rather than directly working with elements from any time, because anytime you want from index, you can just say whatever the array name of that index and you will get that item. That's why we are working with min as an index and not storing the value. So here we compare a of j with a of min, and then we say that, okay, if this is true, then my min is equal to j. And that's it. So inside this for loop, then finally, once you have found out the min after this for loop, right? You will, after, the for, after the j for loop, you'll have the value of min. Then finally, you would want to swap a of min with a of i. And then you will close your outside for loop and close the program. That's it. This is your pseudocode for writing selection sort. How we, how we can implement swap is we have already discussed. You can initialize a temporary variable int temp and then say that temp is temporarily store the value of one of a of i or a of min, doesn't matter, one of it. Then uh, put the value of other right here you have temporary temporary copy of a of i so you can overwrite a of i so now we are overwriting a of i with a of min and finally move from the temp copy to the other variable so a of min is equal to 10. this is how you can implement swap function by using an additional variable it's your uh, quest to uh, find out a method of implementing swap without using additional variable. I remember that. So now you have the selection sort pseudocode over here. 
what will be the complexity of selection sort? First, let's talk about the temporal, com temporal complexity. Can anybody say what will be the temporal complexity in terms of big O? What's the worst case cost of running this algorithm? I virtually hear a few answers and they are correct. Let's go ahead and see. So in order to analyze your temporal complexity, first you need to know your input size for any algorithm. Input size over here is n because your array is of n elements. Second thing, what you need to know as we discussed in our previous module is basic operations. And the basic operations over here, they can be more than one. They can be only one basic operation. Let's look, what are, what are basic operation over here? One operation we can say is comparison, right? Because you are, you are comparing things in this step. You are uh, running a comparison between multiple elements and you're doing it again and again. So your first basic operation is comparison. And your another basic operation is swap because there also you are doing something additional. So we have two basic operation, comparison and swap. How many times do you execute comparison? And how many times do you need to execute swap? How many comparisons we have in total when you run this algorithm? So let's look at that. You have, you will have one comparison every time this if condition is executed, right? How many times this if condition is executed? First is definitely for every i, it's executed from j equals to i plus one to n minus one. So at max, your i can be zero. And this if condition at max, because we are evaluating the worst case cost, think everything worst case. So this condition is definitely um, implemented n times at max, right? Because if your i is zero, this loop will learn from one to n minus one, and that's in the order of n times, this condition, this comparison will be implemented. Let's see, this comparison is implemented n times. So it's the order of big O of n, but you are not yet done. This comparison only within this loop. So for each i, it's implemented n times, but Again, I is iterating here from zero to N minus two. So even I is iterating over your all the elements apart from just last element. So N just iterating over N minus one elements, you can consider asymptotically almost N because one is constant for very large N, your one wouldn't matter. So even I is iterating over all the elements and that's why in total, for every i, you will do n comparisons. So in total, if you have n i's, you will do n square comparisons, correct? So if you consider both these four loops, you will end up doing n square comparisons. And how many swaps you will end up doing in this program? Well, swap, we are not performing swap inside our second for loop. Our second for loop ends and outside that we are performing swap. So swap is performed only within this single for loop and not both the for loops. That's why for, we'll be performing swap for n times because the outside for loop is going over n elements. So at max will perform swap for n times. Now that we know the basic operations and you know the input size, then we'll take for finding the worst case cost, we take max of whatever is the worst. So here number of comparisons are worst then swap. So our big O, the temporal cost of selection sort is big O of N square.
you can also see this by observing these both iterations over here directly. So because you have two iterations over here and one for loop inside the second for loop. So another way to analyze your temporal cost is something like you say that the cost of doing this if operations is C1. The cost of doing the swap operation is sweet C2. Now this if operation is performed for in the whole program, this operation, right? This operation is performed for n square times. So n square C1 times n square and C2 is performed for n times, so C2 times n, and you're finding your T of n, which is your temporal cost. If your equation is this, because the largest order of n item here is n square, so your final temporal cost is big O of n square. What about the spatial cost? Again, your input size is N, spatial cost. We can say in terms of two, we can say the total spatial cost that includes your input size because in order to run any algorithm, you need to have some space to store your input itself, right? So your total space, and we can say the other thing as your auxiliary space. So if someone asks you an interview question about analyze the spatial complexity of this algorithm, the next question you should ask them back is, okay, do you want me to report total space or do you want me to report auxiliary space, right? Auxiliary space is something in addition. Apart from storing input, what you need in addition to that. So here, the total space that we occupy to run this algorithm is big O of N because we are storing n items into our array and we are not using uh, any um, in this algorithm. The total space is in worst case of the order of n because for every iteration, we are not increasing the space that we are using along with every iteration. So, and the auxiliary space that we are using for this algorithm because we are not using any additional space, right? Apart from just the temp variable, which is constant, you are not using any additional space of the order of n or n square or anything because the additional space that you use does not increase with number of iterations. It always remains constant, it's just one variable, even if you swap by using temp. If you swap without using temp, it's not even that. So in whatever the case, however you implement uh, your swap, your auxiliary space that we are consuming is big O of one because it's your constant cost. It does not increase with increase in N. This is your efficiency analysis of selection sort. If you have any further questions on selection sort, you know what's the drill. See me in my office hours with your questions. Next, let's move on to bubble sort. So what did we do in bubble sort generally is compare first two elements and swap if or let's say um yep swap is good swap if the element on right is not larger. So what we are doing in bubble sort is 
now the answer should be at the top of your mind because we have talked this multiple uh, times already until now. What we are doing in bubble sort is we are trying to bubble up the largest element to the end position. So in first situation, we want to bubble up the largest element as your last element. In order to do that, first, what you, first step, what you would do is compare the first two elements and the move the larger one out of these first two elements to the right position. And then you compare the next two elements, again, move the larger one to the right position. Again, you compare next two, move the larger one to the right. So you observe what's happening in this process. You are moving the largest element from all the elements to the rightmost position. So we move the, um, the compare two elements and we will swap if the element on the right is already not the largest in these both element. Then in your second iteration, you will compare next two elements. And again, do the same thing. I'll just use a ditto mark that is same as above, your first step. So you'll do the same process in your second iteration. Again, you will swap if your element on the right is not already the, already the largest. You will keep on doing this until you reach the end of the array. So you will do this until you are comparing the last two elements, right? Because you're comparing in pair of two, once you reach the n minus two as your index, then you are from zero to n minus two. Then at that index, you are comparing the last but one and the last element. And that's it, that's your last iteration. So you will run this from i equals to zero to i equals to n minus two. Basically you will run this for n minus one steps. But you are not yet done. After doing all this, what you have done is you have just bubbled up the largest element to the last position your array is not yet sorted. You got to repeatedly do this again for, so let's, let's not use variable i to, um, just for the simplicity, we'll decide the variables that we want to use soon. So after you are done with this, one iteration of swapping two consecutive elements until you reach the end, just the last element is the largest. You got to repeat this process until you are done with doing all like sorting the whole array, which is not yet sorted after you're done with this n minus one steps. So in order to sort the array, you would have to repeat this bunch of steps that we did over here for n minus one times. And that's when you can ensure that if you continue doing this process for n minus one times, that's when your whole array is sorted. So this is the algorithm that we are following logically. This is the logic of how we will be sorting in bubble sort. Let's look at, look at this with an example. Let's use the same example. And from the example, what you are supposed to do, you know it by now. From the example, you are supposed to write your pseudocode. So when you are processing the example, think of how you would write the pseudocode for performing this algorithm. 29, 34, 17. Again, we have, um, Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements. So now in bubble sort, what we will do is, let's have, again, we'll need two iterations, right? Because in this, you'll need one for loop to complete this set of steps. And then you will need another for loop to repeat these all step set of steps for n minus one times. So you will need two for loop. Let's say your first for loop is starting from i is i 
and it's starting from i equals to zero to i equals to n minus two. And every time what you do is you compare a of i and you compare compare a of i with a of i plus one. So if you run your i from zero to n minus two, in your last iteration, you will compare last but one and the last element. So you don't have to run your i iteration from zero to n minus one, which is the last position, because after that, there is no i plus one. So this is very important to observe. And these are the details that you need to nail down while you are writing your pseudocode. So our i variable is running from zero to n minus two, and we are comparing a of i with a of i plus one. Every time when we compare, what we do? We will do if a of i is greater than a of i plus one, then we will basically swap. And by now, you know how to swap elements. So I'm not going to repeat that. If a of i is greater than a of i plus one, then swap a of i and a of i plus one because we are moving the larger element towards the right position. And this set of code, right? Like this loop of i is going to implement your, this code from here to here this block of code, but you are not yet done. Over this, you need to do this block of code for n minus one times. So what you would do is, why we need to do that? Let's see that. So after you are done with performing this set of code, after your first iteration, what will be the status of your array? Compute that manually. So this array, first you will compare 89 and 45, you will swap them because 89 is greater. So 45, 89. Then you will compare the 89 and 68, and you will again swap them. So 68, 89. Then your next element is 90. You will compare 89 and 90 because 90 is already greater. You don't need to swap them. Then your next element is 29. Then you will compare 90 and 29 because 90 is greater than 29, you'll swap them. Then you will compare 90 and 34 because 90 is greater than 34, you'll swap them. Finally, you will compare 90 and 70 because 17 because 19 is greater than 17. You will swap them and see how after one loop of all these commands over here, your largest element in the array has bubbled up to the last position. This is what we have been talking about. Then, but still you do you observe that whole your array is not yet sorted. It's just the largest element has bubbled up to the top. You still have to bubble up everything else in the remaining positions over here. So there's something else it's again you have to do. If you keep doing the same steps of comparing two elements and moving the larger to the right, right? In your second parse of this array, you will get your second largest element at this position. In your third pass, you will get your third largest element here. Fourth pass, you will get your fourth largest element here. Fifth pass, you will get your fifth largest element here. Sixth pass, you will get your sixth largest element here. Do you need to do the seventh pass? You don't need to do the seventh pass because your last element is already the just single element. So that will be your smallest element that, that will already be at your first index after you are done with your sixth pass. That's where we need to iterate this for n minus one times. If where n is your size, so your size is seven and we are iterating this, this set of command 
repeating that set of command for n minus one times in order to get whole our array sorted. So now you have figured this out and worked this example through until the end to understand it better, not just listen it, but work it out yourself. And I'm leaving it up to you, trusting you to do that. Let's write down our pseudo code for bubble sort. Again, we'll need input argument as our array and size n, same as selection sort. We are having two for loops. So let's say our first for loop, which is your inner for loop will be the one that's iterating over this command, right? That's your inner for loop. And your outer for loop is the one that's repeating the inner for loop for n minus one times. That's your outer for loop. So if we are using I for the inner for loop over here, as we are doing, then let's use some another variable for outer for loop. You can use J, K, anything. Let's use K. For K is equal to, we need to repeat it for N minus one times. So we can iterate K from one to N minus one that ensures N minus one times. We can also iterate start your k from zero to n minus two. Just think out how the remaining things in our algorithm will change with respect to whatever you do. So if you are iterating k from one to n minus one, we are ensuring that we are running this loop for n minus one times. Then inside this for loop, we have another for loop for i equals to zero to n minus two. And inside this for loop, the second for loop, we have if condition where we are comparing a of i, if a of i is greater than a of i plus one, the i for loop, you cannot start from one because then you wouldn't, you will neglect your first element. You need I, a of i when i is equal to zero is your first element in the array. So you have to start from zero. And there is no, and you cannot run it until n minus one because then your index overflow error will happen when, when your i plus a of i plus one command tries to execute. So understand the range of your deciding an appropriate range of your for loop can be one of the error that you might be getting while compiling if that's not correct. Instead of n equals to n minus two, if you keep n equals to n minus one, then your program wouldn't compile because your index will go out of the declared space whenever this a of i plus one element is asked by the program. So we have this if condition. Inside this if condition, we swap if that's true, then we swap. If not, then it doesn't enter into the if condition. And that's it. And then we close our inside inner for loop that runs over i. We close our outer for loop that runs over k and we close our program itself. So this is a bubble sort. Um, this is a simplistic pseudocode for bubble sort. Now take the pseudocode and go write your C++ program, write in a way that you can compile it, write in a way that you can execute it, and then execute with this particular example that we used and see how the sorting is happening. You can print intermediate states whenever you want. You can see out here in this, when you write a C++ code, you can see out whatever you want to play with it and to observe how computer is processing. Is it is computer processing how you would manually process the steps to verify that it's a lot of fun. So what is the temporal complexity of our bubble sort? Again, your input size is N your basic operation is 
is also comparison again, right? Because you are comparing things over here in this if, it's also swap. So you have two basic operation, comparison and swap. How many times for the input size of N, how many times do you have to compare things in worst case? So your comparison will is running inside the inner for loop, right? The inner for loop is executed at max in the order of N. And the inner for loop is running inside an outer for loop, which, ex which is again executed at the order of N. So for every iteration of outer for loop, this inner for loop will execute for n times. So this comparison step will happen n times for inner for loop and for every k, it will happen n times. And that's why for k from n k's, because for every k it's happening for n times. For n k's, in total it will happen for n square times. So comparison is of the order of big O of n square. How about swap? Is your swap of the order of big O of n same as selection sort or is your swap of the order of how many times you need to execute swap over here? You need to execute swap also for order of n square because your swap is again happening inside for loop and inside for loop has an outer for loop of um, that's again running over n variables. So opposed to what selection sort had swap executed for big O of n times, but here swap is also executed for big O of n square times. But when we are finding out the worst case temporal complexity, we find the max of these both, the worst of out of all, and that's still n square. So the temporal complexity of bubble sort is big O of n square. How about the spatial complexity? Again, as we said, spatial complexity has two parts. One is total space occupied and other is auxiliary space occupied. where total space is including the data set. Here, when you are performing your bubble sort, your if your data set size is N, then you need to store that. So your total space is we go of N. Auxiliary spaces, are you using anything additional space apart from the space for the data set? Are we using any additional space? No, because basically whatever we are doing, we are swapping in place. Uh, we are just comparing things. We don't need any sp additional space to compare. And what after comparing, we are swapping things. To swap things, we might use one temporary variable, but you can use the same temporary variable for swapping every time, right? You don't need to use different temporary variables every time you swap. So that the temporary variable is just one variable, which is not increasing with respect to your increase in N. And that's where your auxiliary cost or the auxiliary space that's occupied by the bubble sort is big O of one. Are there any, so finally we are done with our efficiency analysis. I would like to go back to the algorithm. Can you think of any improvement to this algorithm? Can you think of any better way that you can write this code, piece of code? First improvement, definitely the how you implement swap, right? If you are not using a temporary variable, that's an improvement. What else? Is there any other improvements that we can do? I'm sure you smart students, you have observed that when we are processing these things within, within this area, in this example, 
you already have your last element bubbled up here at the end. So in your next iteration, you don't have to go and compare and compare the elements all the way up to the end, right? You just have to compare one minus the end. And then your next iteration, you just have to compare until here because everything to the right is already sorted, is already like in its order, it's, which is supposed to be. So whenever you are placing an element, you don't need to worry about the things of that iteration towards its right. In your first iteration, you need to worry about all the elements. In your second iteration, you have to worry about one less element. That is your last element because that is at its perfect place. It's the largest element and it's at the end of the array. So with this observation, if you set something like, if we had a flag in order to say, when you are processing these iterations, in order to um, observe that, you can work with the iteration ID, right? Every time when you are processing an outer iteration, you don't have to go from all the way from i equals to zero to i equals two and minus two. Rather, you can have this inner loop in some sense of k, when k is equal to one, you have to go till n minus two. When k is equal to two, then you only have to go until n minus three. When k is equal to three, you have only have to go until n minus four and so on and so forth. If you can capture this, so if you can make this in terms of k and k and n both, then you would optimize or you will save some of the energy that you are wasting in comparing the elements that are already sorted. Apart from this, there is an another improvement that still you can do. Let's say your second improvement is inner iterations. save the waste of an inner iterations that you were doing by smartly deciding your loop range. There is another optimization that you can do. Let's say that your array is already sorted, that's given to you. Then in that case, because your array is already sorted, when you perform your inner loop for the first time, you wouldn't swap anything because it's already sorted. And that's it. So once you have identified that if, if, you, if you are not performing any swap, then you don't need to process anything more. You don't need to run the loop over K again. And that's your clue over there. So in order to do that, let's use some another color. Let's use green. What you can, in order to identify if you have an iteration in which you don't need to swap anything, then that's it, just exit. Because after that, if you are not swapping anything, that means your array is already sorted. So if your array was something like one, four, six, you will compare first two. Four is greater than one, so it will be the same. You will compare second two. Six is greater than four, it will be the same. And that's it. So after you have, if you have not swapped anything, in your whole iteration from your first until the last element. So that's your inner loop. If you don't swap anything in your in, inner loop, you don't have to run outer loops for K anymore. Your, you have result of a sorted array. So with this observation, in order to identify if we are not uh, swapping, we can use a flag where we can say that initially before the loop for the I starts, you say that the flag is, is equal to zero. And inside the loop for i, when you swap, you say that flag, you set the flag. So you say flag is equal to one. After you are done the loop with the loop for i, you check if flag is equal to equal to zero. That means you have not swapped anything in the whole iteration, right? That's the only situation where your flag will still be equal to zero. If you have swapped anything, if you have entered the zip condition, 
it will no longer be zero. And in that case, the program will continue as it is in the, in the normal fashion. But if the flag is equal to zero, then you have identified, oh, then I have not swapped anything in the whole iteration. And that's why I don't need to proceed anymore. I don't need to proceed with doing my iterations over K anymore. And I have a sorted array. And so then you break the outside for loop and you exit the program. Or you can say the C out, you can see out all the elements of the array over here, and then you can break. So this is your uh, third optimization that you can do, which is break when the array is sorted, break when sorted. In this way, you save those upcoming iterations which you would have wasted without any reason. So it's just an extra compute power that you would have wasted. We can save time too. Um, so every time you design any pseudocode, think of, are there any ways of improving in a similar fashion? Can you save something on iterations? Can you save something on the range of iteration looping? Can you save something on how you are implementing the functions or save additional space that you are using while, it, while you are implementing a function? These are the basic key towards programming efficiently. Okay, so now let's move on to our last sort, which is insertion sort. If you have any questions in the implementation of bubble sort, or the analysis of its efficiency or anything, then please see me in my office hours. Let's start insertion sort. This is our last basic sort that we'll be looking in this lecture. Let's take, um, so what are the same, what are the logical steps that we are performing in insertion sort? First, we are assuming a virtual boundary. That separates elements on its left as sorted elements and elements on its right as unsorted. Then we move this boundary by one position every time. And whenever we move, we take the element, one element, one element which is at the leftmost position in the right array. So this is something like if your array has 89, 45, 68, 90, 29, 34, and 17. Initially, we say that our virtual boundary is here. There is no element towards its left. Nothing is definitely sorted, right? There's nothing to sort. Then you move the virtual boundary to one position towards its right one element by itself is already sorted. 89 is sorted by itself, right? Because there is no other elements to compare with 89. So iteration by iteration, we are moving the virtual boundary to one element towards right. Then when we move, when we want to move, actually we cannot move because everything towards the left of your virtual boundary should be so sorted. So now when you more want to move your virtual boundary from here to here, then you take this element that's at the leftmost position, temporarily you store that in a value, value equals to 45. 
So make imagine that you make a blank space over here. That's a space. Once you have a space, then you move your virtual boundary over here. And then you compare the elements because you need to insert. It's an insertion sort. Insert is a keyword there. So you need to insert this 45 in this elements towards the left of this array of this boundary in a way that it's in its correct position. So you have to compare in order to do that, you will compare 89 with 45 and you will see if 89 is greater than 45, then 45 is something that will go on the left-hand side of 89, right? And in order to that happen, you need to move 89 to this blank space. So if 89 is greater than 45, you move 89 to the blank space. And then because now there is no more elements towards the left. So because there are no more elements, you insert 45 there. Because here we are inserting, because there are no more elements on the left, we are inserting 45 there. In case when you had more elements on the left, you would keep on doing the same. If the element is greater, then your value, then you would move the element to the space. And then you take the next element, if it's still greater, move it to the space. And so you are moving the space towards the left. Whenever you find an element which is smaller than your value, because your left part of the array, left part of the array from the boundary, that's already sorted. So as soon as you find the first smallest element, you can be sure that everything on the left of that smallest element will definitely be smaller than the smallest element, right? And if the smallest element is smaller than my value, then you have found a correct position to insert that value. So either you will keep, keep moving the space and putting the larger elements into the space either until you reach end of elements or until you reach an element that is smaller than the value. Once you do that, once you are done with that, then you move your boundary to one more position towards the left. Again, to move the boundary one more position towards the right, sorry. To move the boundary one more position towards the right, you cannot just directly do that because everything to the left of the boundary should be sorted. So you take this element, whichever is at the um, right of the boundary, and you store again, store it into the temporary variable or the value where you say, okay, value is equal to 68. And then you create a space over here. And then you move your boundary from one more position towards the right. And then you do keep doing the same thing. You compare 89 and 68. 89 is greater than 68. So you would move 89 to the space where 89 is moved to the space and imagine that the space is moving towards the right, right? And then you would uh, compare 45 with 68 here, although you have not reached the end of the array, but you have found an element that's smaller than 68. And that's where as soon as you find an element that's smaller than 68, you insert 68 into the space. That's it, you are done with, you are done with the inserting 68. And when your boundary, when you keep doing this and when your boundary reaches the last element, then everything will be towards the left of the boundary, right? When your boundary is the last element. And if everything is to the left or left of the boundary, that means those, all the, all that elements are already sorted. So that's how you uh, end this sort when everything reach, when your boundary reaches towards the rightmost corner. So this is the algorithm for insertion sort where you assume a virtual boundary that separates the element and then move the virtual boundary one by one. to the right. What you're doing within this, every time when you want to move the boundary, what you're doing is 
take the element, take element. to the right of the boundary and insert it into its appropriate position in the left sorted part. How we are doing this insert is by using this concept of space. Now, while you are running the program, you wouldn't have the space, right? But space is an analogy of you're having some information there. It doesn't matter if you overwrite that information because that information, you already have some another copy of that information. So whatever we are talking in terms of space over here, that can be anything in terms of your, uh, when, when your algorithm is processing and that anything could be overwritten by any other variables. So whenever you are, we are moving the value, if it's larger, if the value, um, if the element is larger than the value, then we are moving it to the space, right? That space can be empty or it can be any other element that's overwritten, doesn't matter. Let's write the pseudocode for insertion sort. Again, before we move to the pseudocode, I highly encourage that you take this example, right? And follow the steps by processing it through your hand. Like if you don't understand, you can't write a program for computer to understand that and do that. So first it's important for any logic for you to understand it in and out thoroughly. And then definitely you can write an efficient program and you won't go wrong when you write a program after you understand the concept very well. So in order to understand the concept very well, take this example and follow its execution of follow the iterations of how things will happen if you are running an insertion sort logic with your hand manually. So as we were, as we just started discussing over here, take that, move the boundary. We move the boundary until one position. Um, initialize the boundary over here and then fill your iterations and the steps of how things are going to happen, right? Then finally, after we write the pseudocode, you will write the C++ code. You can give to that C++ code the same example and print out your intermediate steps and verify the intermediate steps that you manually did, are they exactly what computer is executing? And that's a fun to see that. So hope you have fun with that. Once you have done, you are done with your example. Okay, once you are done processing and tracing every iteration in your example manually, then you will be equipped yourself to write your pseudocode in a much efficient manner. Let's write the pseudocode. Insertion sort. Again, same as the selection sort and the bubble sort, you will need input arguments as array A and int N, which is your size of the array. Now in insertion sort, we will, again, we have concept of having two loops. You can use for loop, you can use while loop, you can use to do while loop, anything. Doesn't matter what syntactic uh, loop are you using, but we have concept of having two loops. What are these loops doing? So first loop will iterate over first outside loop is iterating from i equals to one to n minus one because it needs to iterate for n times for n elements. And every time when you are iterating from that first position of the i, 
when there's only one element, you don't need to compare. So you can start your first loop. You can start your boundary, not from the zero, but automatically to be more efficient, you can start your boundary right from after the first element. So you can have your I because this is your zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So while we want to move the boundary, we are comparing the left most element to the boundary, right? That's our, that's what we want to insert. So we can trace that element using this iteration over I from one to n minus one, right? But this is just the one loop. Now, every time when you want to insert the element that you have at that location, so temporarily we store, okay, in order to move the boundary, you need to make the space. Space is something that you can overwrite. So you will declare a temporary variable value and you will store A of i into value. Then that gives you an analogy of imagining a space and your boundary is just virtual. You're not declaring anything. That's just your imagination. So you move your boundary. Now that the space is here, you compare the elements. So you are not yet done. You have one more loop to go. In the second loop, in order to insert this A of I or the value at its appropriate position, you need to iterate over all the elements to the left of the boundary. And what you need to do is start from the largest element over here, compare that with A of i. If that largest element is greater than your value or A of i, then you move that element to one position towards its left, towards its right into the space. So that's your other loop that's running. This loop you can say the end condition of this loop is either when there are no more elements, right? When the space is your last and then there are no more elements, you will move this 89 here. So the end condition is two, it can be two possibilities. Either your space is your and there are no more elements towards left, further left of it. So then you insert your value, whatever is there. there. Or all the elements towards the left are smaller than the value. That's the case we encountered in our second iteration in this example over here. So then we inserted our 68 at the position whenever we found an element towards the left that's smaller than the value. Then we inserted the element there. So there are two conditions for this loop to break. We can say, let's, say, let's use for a change, let's use while loop. So you can say while, because we are using the concept of space, space, let's define that index as space, the index of wherever we are having the space currently. Let's define that variable as space. Where while space, so in this case, when you move value to A of i, initially your space will be i. That's the index where you have a space. So while space is either greater than zero, that means if your space is greater than zero, then when your space becomes lesser than zero, that means you don't have any elements towards the left. It needs to be greater than zero. So while either space is greater than zero and or A of space minus one is greater than value. As soon as you find an element where your A of space minus one, because you are taking every element towards the left, that's where it's minus one. As soon as you find an element where A of space minus one is smaller than the value, that's it, then you exit this loop. So these are two important conditions to understand for designing this uh, loop that's inserting the element that we have in the value at its appropriate sorted location. So we have a for loop and then we have a while loop. So our for loop 
is iterating from i is equal to 1 to n minus 1, where inside our for loop, what we do is we take the element at a of i, store it in the value, and we say that, OK, now we have created space at index i. After these steps, we have while loop where we say while keep doing this until either the space is greater than zero. So keep doing it until the space is greater than zero. And space minus one is greater than value. So keep doing this if these two conditions are true. As, as soon as any one of these condition is violated, exit this while loop. What you will do inside this while loop is move the element that's there in that space, uh, A of space minus one to one position towards its right. So in order to move that element to one position towards its right, the position towards its right is nothing but A of space. Right, the position towards the right of A of space minus one is A of space. Space is the index. So A of space is equal to A of space minus one. And you are not yet done because it's a while loop. You have to uh, manage your index by yourself. If it's a for loop, you just say for I plus plus and it manages the loop, manages the index. Here you will have additional command to manage index. It's while loop over the space variable. So we'll say space is equal to space minus one. Our space is moving towards the left. That means it's not incrementing, but it's decrementing. That's where we have space equals to space minus one. That's it, that's our while loop. And finally, after our while loop is done, um, when the while loop exit, you will have a space, which is a perfect place to insert your value, right? Because everything towards the left of that space will be smaller and everything to the right of that space will be bigger after you are done with this while loop. So your final step is A of space is equal to value. And that's it, you are done. This is the algorithm for your, the pseudocode for your insertion sort. Sometimes I use word algorithm and pseudocode interchangeably, but don't get confused. Algorithm is your logic. Pseudocode is in terms of computer programming language, how would computer process that logic? And the code is finally something that compiler understands. And compiler has different languages, C++, Java, whatever compiler you're using. Pseudocode can be converted into that particular language oriented code. So this is our pseudocode. Um, and every time when we are writing pseudocodes, we are writing, we are capturing the logic of algorithm in the language of computer and variables. So what is the efficiency of insertion sort? What is temporal complexity of insertion sort? Again, your input size. Now I think you uh, guys and girls and everyone, you should have your, uh, you must have become expert in analyzing efficiency, right? We did it for selection sort, we did it for bubble sort. So you should have your answer at the tip of your tongue. You know, when as soon as I say, what is your efficiency? You should have your answer ready. If that's the case, very good, keep it up. So your input size is N. The basic operation, I'm hearing some chorus answers, a crowd speaking there. Again, your basic operation is comparison because we are comparing the things um, when we, one of your basic operation is comparison because here you are comparing the values that are, if it's, if A of space minus one is larger than the value, this is this is where your compar comparison is lying. 
and your other basic operation is do you have other basic operation no you don't have you don't have a concept of swap over here so your basic operation is comparison and how many times are you running comparison how many times do you have to go through this comparison so within this loop right while this while loop is executing this comparison will for your imagine for your last iteration this comparison will at most happen for n times for your last iteration because then you have everything towards the left of the boundary and while you are inserting an element in worst case that element that you want to insert will be the smallest element so you have to compare and move your space until you reach that last location of the space so this while loop will run n times at max and this while loop is running within this for loop as you see the for loop is running for again n times worst case so comparison needs to be done for every index of this for loop you need to do n comparisons in this while loop for n index of this for loop you have to do total n square comparisons and that's why the worst case cost of this algorithm is also big o of n square the another way of finding the temporal cost is by using constant and the concept of that so with that you can say like these operations over here they take some constant time let's say c1 right these operations over here they take another amount of constant time let's say c2 and this operation takes another amount of constant time let's say c3 now we are find when we are finding t of n that's our temporal complexity or temporal cost what we do is we need to find out how many times each of these operation is executed so in worst case c1 will be executed inside this for loop for n times and c3 will also be executed inside the for loop for n times so we can say c1 plus c3 will be executed for n times or n minus 1 times where because one is constant and we are trying to find out the asymptotic cost you can neglect the constants and just consider the worst case so these will be executed exactly n minus 1 times plus we are not yet done we need to find out how many times the c2 will be executed so in your first iteration your c2 will be executed one time because there is only one element towards your left and you need to in worst case if your item is smaller than that one element you need to do one shift so your the cost of c2 will be one in your second iteration the c2 will be implemented two times because you have two elements towards the left of the boundary so in worst case you need to move the space two times and so on and so forth in your third iteration it will be implemented in worst case for three times in your last iteration it needs to be implemented for n minus 1 times so this 1 plus 2 plus 3 until n minus 1 c2 that's the total number of time c2 will be implemented sorry not c3 c2 so when you add these both terms over here if you uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 until n minus 1 that can be converged to say as let me use some another color that can that will be that can be converged to your expression n into n minus 1 by 2 so we can say uh, this amount of c2 and n minus 1 amount of c1 plus c3 this both terms needs to be added if you solve this equation over here then i'm just moving on to the right side if you solve that equation there you will get something like a terminology of n square by 2 c2 
minus n by 2 c2 plus n c1 minus c1 plus n c2 minus c2. These all are constants we can remove. In total, we see that the highest order polynomial over here is n square, right? And then you can combine this, take n outside, and this take n outside combining these three terms and into some constant, let's say x plus some another constant y, which is combination of c1 plus c2. So in this polynomial equation, t of n, your highest order is n square. And that's why the cost of this algorithm is big O of n square. This is how you analyze the temporal complexity of any algorithm. You need to find out how many, what statement are executed, what's the cost of any statement. Assume that as some constant, if they're simple operations like assignment, and then find out how many times those simple operations are repeated. Once you have the number of, the concept of number of times those simple operations are repeated for all the functions in the program, then add them up. And that's how you get your total temporal complexity. Add them up and then pull the order of the highest term out of it. That's your worst case temporal cost. What is the spatial cost over here? Your total space that you are occupying is the input size, right? Are you using any additional space out of input size? The value, the value is just a constant variable. So again, same as before, your total space that you are occupying is of the order of big O of N and the auxiliary space that you're occupying while processing insertion sort is of the constant order, big O of one. Big O of one doesn't mean just one additional variable. So you don't need to have big O of one, big O of two something. Big O of one is generally, it represents constant cost. And sometimes you can also say it's big O of C, where C is that constant. So many times when you see big O of one, that doesn't mean that you are just using one additional space. So you wouldn't see things like big O of two, big O of three, big O of four, if you're using four additional space. But 